Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Simon Cole. I'm the director of the Newkirk Center for Science and Society and an associate editor of the National Registry of Exonerations, which is now housed here at UCI in collaboration with the University of Michigan School of Law and Michigan State University School of Law. This is our um, first inaugural event in what we're calling the Wrongful Convictions Film and Book Series. It was originally the Wrongful Convictions Film Series, um, but then Lara wrote a book, so um, we, we had to change it. And we're hoping to have one event per quarter. In the winter quarter, we're gonna have the f documentary film uh, Southwest of Salem, which is about the well-known uh, San Antonio Four case. And in the spring quarter, we're hoping to have um, The Confession Tapes, which is a uh, Netflix series. Um, so today's event is um, intended to be a, a sort of a modular event. Um, uh, those of you who um, have limited endurance um, are encouraged to, to stay for this event, which will go till five, and then we'll have a reception afterwards. Um, and those of you with really great endurance can stay on. And then at six o'clock, we will be showing the film Crown Heights, which is not a documentary, just uh, so you know. It's a feature film um, about a well-known wrongful conviction case. And it's based on a uh, This American Life story. And th that was then turned into a film. We're going to have the director of the film, Matt Ruskin, uh, here to answer questions afterwards. So the film will be from around six o'clock to around eight o'clock. And it will not be here. Um, um, it will be in the McCormick Screening Room, which is room 1070 in the Humanities Gateway, in the Humanities part of campus. If you need help um, finding that, ask me or someone else who looks like they know what they're doing. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll direct you up there. So uh, for this afternoon's event, I'm very um, pleased to introduce Lara Bazelon, and then she's going to introduce the rest of the panel. Um, Lara Bazelon is an associate professor of law and the director of the criminal, justice, ju criminal Juvenile Justice and Racial Justice Clinical Programs at the University of San Francisco School of Law. From 2012 to 2015, she was a visiting associate clinical pro professor at Loyola Law School and director of the Loyola Law School Project for the Innocent. She was a trial attorney in the Office of the Federal Public Defender in Los Angeles for seven years. And prior to that, she was a law clerk for the Honorable Harry Pragerson on the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Her scholarship focuses on the intersection of ethics and criminal justice advocacy. She's the co-chair of the American Bar Association's Ethics, Gideon, and Professionalism Committee, where she's organized roundtables at law schools across the country to develop and revise ethical standards. I was invited to one of those, wasn't I? Yes. Um, in the areas of mental health and forensic science. And in January 2017, she was selected to serve a three-year term on the American Bar Association's Criminal Justice Council. You know her probably as a contributing writer for Slate and Politico magazine, where her long-form journalism and opinion pieces appear regularly. She has a long-running series in Slate on issues arising from wrongful convictions. She's written essays and op-eds for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, Fusion, and the Los Angeles Times. And she's uh, written a book, which is our focus for today, about wrongful convictions and restorative justice called Rectify. Um, she's the recipient of a Writer in Residency Award from the McDowell Colony in 2016. Um, and she's a non-resident senior fellow at Brandeis University's Schuster Institute for Investigative Journalism. So please welcome Lara Bazelon. Thank you, Simon, Professor Cole, for having me, for hosting this awesome event. I'm really excited to be here and speak to all of you. I'm gonna do a very short kind of overview about why I wrote the book that I actually prepared because USF, where I teach, had a competition called Pecha Kucha, where various people representing the various schools in the university had to do a presentation in 15 slides, and it goes 20 seconds a slide. And so you have to talk um, in 20 second bites. So this is, when I say short, I mean short. And I'm not exactly sure that it's gonna, the clock will work exactly right. So 
If there's a technological issue, I will probably just shut it down and speak extemporaneously. Um, I want to just briefly back up and talk about sort of how I came to write this book before I do the Pecha Kucha and also introduce the co-panelists. So I want to start by saying that um, it wouldn't have been possible for me to research and write this book without the National Registry of Exonerations, which is this unbelievably rich resource that was developed by Professor Samuel Gross and Rob Warden and by Maurice Posley, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, formerly of the Chicago Tribune, investigative reporter extraordinaire, who is here on this panel. And he'll speak to that work, but it is unbelievable. It tracks every known exoneration starting from 1989. They have profiles on every single person. The data is cross-referenced across um, race and gender and type of crime. They issue reports on a yearly basis summarizing their findings. For anybody interested in wrongful convictions, it's a resource that you would be insane to overlook. And it's also beautifully done. So the website is highly interactive. You can scroll over state by state and see who has the most exonerees and who has the fewest. They look into things like whether people have conviction review units that are looking into wrongful convictions. And so it's just this amazing resource. And Maurice and, and Sam, before he stepped away from the project, were so helpful to me. So it's a real honor to have him here. And I'm excited. I'm excited for your presentation. So Maurice will speak for about 10 minutes. He has some prepared remarks. Um, also with us today is William Richards, Bill. Bill is an exoneree. His story is unbelievable, and I don't want to presume to tell it. I will just say that the ordeal that he went through started in the early 1990s with the murder of his wife, and he was wrongfully convicted. And that conviction was obtained um, through concerted efforts by the district attorney's office that he'll probably speak to, but are quite extraordinary in just the absolute zeal to convict in, in the face of a case that really was supported by no evidence, and even after that evidence was destroyed, a continued zeal to the point where they tried to prosecute him for a fifth time, or at least threatened to. So he's going to speak to the experience of being wrongfully convicted as someone who lost the person closest to him and then was blamed for that and spent over 25 years incarcerated wrongfully and what that experience was like. And then kind of rounding out the picture, so we have Maurice talking about it from a reporter's point of view and a journalistic point of view and kind of the 3,000 foot view. And then we have Bill speaking from the exoneries perspective. And then finally, and not least, we have Christy Shepard. And Christy is going to give you the perspective of the crime victim's family. So, Christy was only eight, and she'll tell you this story, when her cousin, who she was very close to, was murdered. And again, this is a wrongful conviction case, which she'll talk about. And it became a very famous case. It was um, actually the subject of John Grisham's book, An Innocent Man, which some of you may have read. She's going to speak to what the experience of a wrongful conviction is like from the victim's perspective, because their perspective is often overlooked in this whole process, particularly once the exoneration comes to light. And it's important to know that side of the story as well. So the goal here is really to give you kind of a, a 360 degree view. Um, and my interest in this is that, um, yes, I was an innocence lawyer at, at Loyola, and we had one very astounding case that had a huge impact on me. But then also, through just research and thinking about it after that case, I came to be really interested in all the different perspectives, in particular connecting with other exonerees and then crime victims to learn kind of both sides of the story and how the process played out. And through that, I learned about this thing called restorative justice, which I had never heard of, which, which my book is, is, is about. Um, and so without further ado, I think I'll try to actually make this presentation work. Like I said, it's short. So the justice system is supposed to be about right and wrong and winning and losing. A wrongful conviction is a failure of that system for the exonerated, for the crime victims and their families. No one wins and everyone loses. They live in a psychological prison even after it's over. My client Cash Delana Register was convicted of murder in 1979. I was in kindergarten. Cash was innocent, but it took 34 years to prove it. These pictures were taken the day that he was exonerated. November 7th, 2013, I had grown up and become his lawyer. Now it was my son who was in kindergarten. Exonerees like Cash are not alone in their trauma. There are also the crime victims who never got justice. This is Janet Burke, who was raped in a daycare center where she worked in 1984. The police gave Janet pictures of suspects to look at. She picked Thomas Hainsworth. She was positive. 
So were four other women who were attacked around the same time within a one mile radius. Thomas was convicted in back to back to back to back trials and sentenced to life in prison, but the attacks continued. 12 more women were assaulted in the same part of Richmond, Virginia before the police arrested a man named Leon Davis Jr. 10 months later, and suddenly the attacks stopped. Thomas was, oh right, okay. Here are Thomas Hainsworth and Leon Davis's mugshots side by side. Janet and the four other women were never shown Davis's picture. They wanted the police to get the bad guy, and so they picked the person who looked the most like him. This kind of faulty eyewitness identification, which happened subconsciously, is particularly likely to occur across racial lines. Thomas's exoneration, like Cash's, was not easy. In Janet's case, there was DNA evidence. In two other cases, the DNA evidence had been destroyed. But a remarkable team of allies, three different prosecutors, and Janet Burke joined Thomas's lawyer to urge the Virginia Court of Appeals to overturn the remaining two convictions. Thomas prevailed barely by a vote of six to four, and he was released on March the 21st, 2011. It was his 46th birthday, and he had been in prison for 27 years. There was a crush of media attention. One of the reporters asked Thomas how he felt. I'm glad my mother is alive, so she can see this, he said. The media coverage gives us only a snapshot in time. The embrace, the exoneree giving thanks to his lawyers, to family, to friends, and to God. It's all too easy to turn the page or hit the escape button and think that the nightmare is over and that the exoneree will ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after. But an exoneration is not a fairy tale, it's an earthquake, leaving upheaval and ruin in its wake. Not only for the exonerees like Thomas and Cash, but for the crime victims like Janet, the jurors who returned the guilty verdicts, and everyone else who worked so hard to carry out what proved to be the worst kind of injustice. How big a problem is this? In 2016, 168 people were exonerated, which is more than three a week. By conservative estimates, there are more than 61,000 people in prison who don't belong there. That is roughly the capacity of Soldier Stadium, which is where the Chicago Bears play football. What can be done? Some exonerees and original crime victims are coming together using restorative justice practices to dig deep into a shared mutual trauma, heal and move forward with their lives. There is an organization called Healing Justice that brings these survivors together. The criminal justice system asks three basic questions. What law was broken? Who broke it? And what punishment is deserved? Restorative justice takes these questions and reframes them in a radically different way to ask who was harmed? What are their needs? And whose obligation is it to meet those needs? Janet Burke and Thomas Hainsworth went through their own restorative justice process. Now they call or text each other almost every day. Thomas told Janet, my love is not perfect, but God's love is perfect and I can forgive with that. Janet, who had lost her faith, said that their relationship had given her something to believe in again. Jennifer Thompson, the founder of Healing Justice, asked a crime victim to bring a sapling from the survivor tree to the restorative justice retreat. The survivor tree was one of the few left standing after the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, an act of terrorism that claimed 168 lives, including 15 children. There was a ceremony to plant the sapling. Thompson said, this tree is in memory of all of those we couldn't save and all of those we won't save, but it is also in honor of all of us here and all of us who have survived. This tree will shelter us, provide shade and endure, and we will watch it grow. We are still standing and our roots are deep. So that is in essence why I, I wrote my book. It was to really get to so many of these stories. And what I should also say is that the crime victim family member who brought the sapling to North Carolina where it was planted is sitting here with us today. It's Christy Shepard. And the picture that you saw on the screen is her daughter, Addie, holding the sapling, looking towards the Oklahoma City Memorial. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Maurice to talk about his work and then I think we'll just go one by one and then hopefully we'll have time for questions. I should also say that Bill has a short film that he will show as well. So thank you. Can I close this? 
I'm the senior uh, researcher for the National Registry of Exonerations, and as was mentioned in a previous life, I worked as a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Um, my wife, Kathleen Falsani, is a journalist as well who writes about religion. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so when I covered criminal justice in Chicago, um, our beats didn't really cross too much, although some of our conversations did, um, in part because I was and still remain fascinated by the element of faith um, that is present in uh, the lives of people who get convicted wrongly and emerge from prison relatively intact. Almost to a person, they had to find some sort of they did find some sort of faith element to put one foot in front of another. It's, how, it's hard enough to do it the time when you committed the crime, let alone when you're, when you're innocent. And something that came up in our conversations more than once um, are three simple sentences that um, I think are applicable here today. Justice is getting what we deserve. Mercy is getting what we don't deserve. And grace, excuse me, mercy is not getting what we deserve. And grace is getting what we don't deserve. Um, I think for the record, and I wasn't told I had to even mention this book, but I'm going to, because I think it's truly a grace. Um, it's something that we didn't ask for. Laura gave it to us. And it's so good that it's easy to say we aren't worthy of it. I recommend it for its storytelling and its revelations. She has truly captured some of the rawest emotion in a compassionate and revelatory manner. Um, in May of 12, 2012, the registry came into public view. It had been um, a project for a number of years. And um, since that time as senior researcher, um, what I do is gather the documents and the data and put it into the system, goes through a coding process, as well as every case gets a narrative summary that tells basically how the person came to be charged with the crime, how they came to be convicted, and how they came to be exonerated, and what went wrong that caused them to be wrongfully convicted. As of today, there's 2,280 exonerees uh, in the registry. This is since January of 1989. They represent 20,265 years lost to incarceration. That's one measure of the pain and suffering um, that emanates from these cases. Um, I'm familiar with others, both as a journalist who investigated cases of wrongful conviction and uh, as senior researcher. I've written more than 1,600 of the summaries in, the, in, in there, and each one is a separate tragedy. Um, for some, it only involves being wrongfully convicted. One third of the cases, and there no crime was committed. So there is no victim, so to speak. But even those cases, beyond the person who was wrongly convicted, have victims. As an example, there's a case in Texas of a man who was a stepfather who was accused by his seven year old stepson of molesting him. And he was convicted, no physical evidence, based solely on the testimony. He got sentenced to 20 years in prison, and he did, the, he did 10 years, and he got released. And he came back to the West Texas town, and um, the seven-year-old now is uh, almost 18, and they run into each other on the street, and this teenager says, where have you been? You dropped out of my life. And he said, are you not aware that your testimony was what sent me to prison for the last 10 years? And he had been convinced that by the, the mother, that if he didn't testify this way, he would never see his mother again, and this was a divorce proceeding, and this is what he had to say. Um, so there were multiple victims, even in a no-crime case. Um, in the larger group, the one where there are victims, there are multiple tragedies as well. Not only is the wrong person convicted, but the victims one day, sometimes decades later, learn a different truth. What they once believed is not true. Um, I want to read just a short passage because 
Lars captured this, I think, in a way better than I could. I mean, this is, she calls it one of the um, really abiding wounds inflicted by a wrongful conviction, and that is the loss of peace and order that people have the sense of the, not only the criminal justice system, but of their own lives and how they put things in order. It says, while the crimes that shattered their lives happened thousands of miles apart, and in different decades, the repercussions have a familiar rhythm. There is the life upending violation, be it the victimization or false arrest. There is the result, conviction and removal from society. And when the truth erupts, with all of its outsized consequences, exposing a system that is rife with venality, bias, and cruelty, the revelations are not freeing. A wrongful conviction is a psychological prison for everyone snagged in its net. The question is how to get out. Um, and I think that really captures um, what this book attempts to, and I think successfully has addressed. Um, as a journalist, I certainly was involved in some of these personally, in this rewriting of history, and um, just from a journalistic perspective, and I'll just mention two quick cases. In, in 2003, um, I was with another reporter, Steve Mills, working on a case where it was two young teenagers, 17, been convicted and sentenced to life in prison for the murder and rape of a nine-year-old girl, and we found new evidence, and at some point before you publish, one of the things you have to do is you have to go talk to the family. Because in part, this was important because the part of the narrative of when the girl went missing and was when it was discovered she was missing had been established by the mother's testimony. And we had shown that that was not correct. And so we were going to say, look, your testimony was not correct and here's the proof. And in addition to that, we have evidence that the men that you think did this crime we're not the people. And I, I, today I can still hear the sort of the, the, the disbelief and, and rejection in her voice. Um, and I knew it was the beginning of a different life for her when we left that interview. Um, I never spoke to her again. Um, and to this day, the real killer has not been identified. Um, in 2006, Steve Mills and I reinvestigated a wrongful execution in Texas. Um, and after, when we identified who the real killer was, who by that time had, had died in a Texas prison 10 years after Carlos de Luna had been executed, um, before we published, we went to see Carlos de Luna's sister. So this is 15 years after he's been executed. And she listened as we told her about all the evidence that we had gathered that showed that her brother was innocent and that another man also named Carlos, Carlos Hernandez, had committed the crime. And she looked at us and she said, what good does this do me now? And I didn't know how to answer that question. But the pain and anguish in that response, what made it worse was she explained that over the years she had come to believe that, in fact, her brother was guilty. Because that was her way of dealing with it, that the state must have been right, and that, at the time, she was wrong, and that Carlos's protestations of innocence at the time were wrong. And so that was just almost a compound, exponentially worse. Um, all these realities shake people to their core, some refuse to comprehend it. They believe the person is guilty in spite of what the evidence is. Some of this is reinforced by police and prosecutors who refuse to acknowledge the truth. Um, Lars written about these. Um, uh, innocence deniers is the term that's used. Um, some people accept the truth grudgingly. Um, some as so, is so eloquently really portrayed in, in this book embrace it and find a new peace, getting past the guilt and the angst. Um, when I 
would visit, do, when I would investigate wrongful conviction cases, one of the things I would always do was go to prison and meet with the people because I wanted to get a sense of them if I'm going to investigate their case. And um, in 1999, um, Steve and I, we were kind of joined at the hip for a number of years, went to a prison to see Calvin Allens, who had been arrested at age 14, pulled out of bed at one in the morning and convicted and sentenced to life in prison after they said he confessed to taking part with his cousin and two others in the abduction and murder of a medical student on the west side of Chicago. And um, one of the questions I always ask uh, when I interview people is, you know, who comes to see you? Because it gives me leads, perhaps, of people, family members who might be able to have documents, have memories back at the time um, that were never investigated by police. Um, and when I asked Calvin that question, so this, you know, he was 14 in 1986, and now it's 1999. So he's a, a grown human being, spent more than half of his life, half of his life behind bars. Who comes to see you? And he said, well, nobody. And I said, well, really, don't you have family? And he said, well, yeah, I have, you know, I have a mother, and I have brothers and sisters. And they would come to see me at first, and then just my mama came, and then she rode, and then she stopped riding. And I said, well, how do you handle that? And he, I, I said, well, well, why? And he said, well, because they think I did it. And I said, well, how do you handle that? And he said, um, well, I have a good job here. And every month I send a check out and it goes into a bank. A friend puts it in a bank account for me. And the day that I get out of here, um, I'm going to have that money. And I said, the state says you die here. You have life without parole. Um, how do you know that even money is even there? And he said, oh, I know it's there because I know that someday God will get me out of here. And then two years later, I watched him walk out of prison. Um, so that faith element is pretty powerful. And then one last story. It's about people who come out of prison um, in a way. Daniel Taylor was a 17-year-old kid who was arrested and convicted of murder in Chicago and got life without parole. And when we reinvestigated his case and turned up new evidence, it took a long time. Um, we first published stories on that in 2003, and he finally um, was exonerated in 2013. It was a few days before Christmas, and the charges were dismissed in Chicago. And before his lawyers could actually get in touch with him, it was, it was, they, they were taken by surprise. The, they did not know the state was going to do that that day. Um, and the state had already called down to the prison and told them that that was going to happen. And this is about 300 miles south of Chicago in the dead of winter. And so they came to his cell and they said, get your stuff. And he thought he was being transferred to a different prison. And instead, they took him out to the front gate, gave him a bus pass, and he had his commissary, a little bit of his commissary, and said, have a nice life. He wasn't even sure how to get on the phone. How to, where, where to go. And this was a guy who, at, in 1992, when he was 17 and arrested, and now it's 21 years later, he's now almost 40 years old. And was, what he told me was, for the first year of my life afterwards, I had trouble going from one room to another because I'd spent most of my life not being able to step across a threshold without asking for permission. I didn't want to leave my bedroom and go out into the hallway in the morning unless someone was there so that I could say, is it OK? So what Lara captures in this book is a lot of this from the victim's families, from the exonerees, from the perspective, from many perspectives. These are just some of the stories. And the stories I'm telling today, most of them, Carlos de Luna isn't in the registry. Most of them are because he isn't because he was executed. And so and unless there's a posthumous exoneration, it won't happen. I wish that every one of the 2,280 people in there could get some restorative justice. Some have, and some never will, I imagine. This book, though, provides this portrait of the power of it. The process of peace and reconciliation is a noble one. Um, but of course, before reconciliation must come truth. And the truth can be documented. 
the pain to accepting and embracing that truth and moving onward is painful and difficult, and it's one that is increasingly being taken on by family members, victims' families, um, and even some folks in the criminal justice system, and that can only be for the better. If you've ever been accused, somebody ever said you did something, even the littlest thing that you didn't do, you know how it irritates you? Well, figure a quarter of a century being like that, a quarter of a century thinking, I didn't do this, I don't deserve this, it just eats at you like a cancer. So I was accused of killing my wife. I came home, found her dead. The police decided I was guilty before they got to the crime scene because it was easy, just blame the husband and the case is over. And at first I thought she fell and got hurt because it was dark and I hadn't seen the crime scene, hadn't realized what had happened. They had had a generator there because they were building a property. And when Bill got home, all the lights were out, the generator had gone out. And he actually walked across the yard and tripped over his wife's dead body. I realized that it was a crime scene. What the police did was they walked around, they walked into the crime scene, which they later lied in court, said they didn't do. Smoking, dropping cigarette butts, contaminating the scene. They stood around her body. And later on, I come to find out they didn't take any fingerprints, they didn't take any DNA. They basically did absolutely nothing but take some photographs. So when it came down to trying to prove who did this, we're still in the dark. It's one of those things, it's so hard to investigate a homicide case decades later. And when the police don't do it right on that night, that first night when the body's found, it's very hard to play catch up later on. And there were just a lot of mistakes that were made. At the California Innocence Project, we have several different missions. Number one, get innocent people out of prison. Number two, provide a really good educational experience for law students who are enrolled in the clinic. And number three, to affect policy change to help prevent wrongful convictions and to help people once they're out of prison who have been wrongfully convicted. The leading cause of wrongful convictions is bad eyewitness identification. Um, and for the most part, it's not a malicious situation. Other wrongful convictions happen due to things like bad lawyering, bad science, uh, informants, and even false confessions. One of the really bad things about prison is it takes people out of society and then it takes them out of normal life. And that's really contrary to rehabilitation because now you put them back in that life and now it's even harder than before they went in. Exonerees, especially been down over two decades and stuff, we're, we're an anachronism, we're out of space and time, we don't belong here. Our minds are still way back there. Uh, we have to catch up on technology, we have to catch up I, on everything. I drive down the street I used to live on, I don't recognize it because the trees are so big. They're just little sprouts, and now there's a canopy over top. That makes you realize how long you've been gone. I think every citizen has a responsibility to understand about wrongful convictions and our justice system because it's our collective justice system. I'm very jaded about the justice system. I now understand, which I didn't before, how corrupt it is. The trials are a dog and pony show. It's, it's who can tell the biggest lie. And they're not all that way, don't get me wrong, but a lot of them are. And that's why you've got so many innocent people in prison. I think one of the best things that people can do is to acknowledge that it's a problem and that it happens more often than we like to think. Because I think the issue that we're up against right now is people don't believe that wrongful convictions actually occur as often as they do. If we're gonna give our government the awesome power to lock people up for the rest of their lives and to execute people, then we need to be careful that we're doing it as best we can. I was ruled, the judge's ruling in 2009 was that the evidence pointed unerringly to innocence. It took seven years, a change of law, and a Supreme Court ruling to get me out after that. You have to try to fit in, you have to get ahead, you have to move forward.
Okay, well now you know who I am. I'd like to mention that this was actually made by a 15-year-old film student. <laughs> so it won um, Best Documentary at uh, San Diego Film Festival. So, okay, what I'd like to do is reiterate on some things that uh, Maurice said out of Laura's book. Oh, I'd like to thank Laura and Lori for inviting me here. Um, in my case, it was like many, where they planted evidence, um, perjured themselves. All the witnesses against me were pleased. They perjured themselves on the stand. Uh, they destroyed exculpatory evidence. There was DNA on the victim's fingernails. There's DNA on the murder weapon, all not matching me. And yet I still went to prison for all that time. And as said in the video, a judge ruled me innocent. It took seven more years and extensive legal work to get me out after that. They actually had to change the law. You always hear where, on TV shows, where criminals are getting away with technicalities. Well, that's not true. The technicalities keep innocent people in. They use the technicality to ignore seven people with doctorate degrees. With scientific proof I was innocent, they just ignored it and said, well, we're not going to use it. So the law was changed because my case was so vile that they could do this. I'd already been ruled innocent. There was all the scientific proof I was innocent that the legislature overwhelmingly passed the new law saying you can't do that. So, and I <clears throat> know several, uh, well, a couple exonerees that have actually gotten out because of a changed law. So it cost me seven years, but it's saving more people now. But the fact is, when you get out of prison, everybody thinks, like they said, you think you walk out, you're free. Well, I can open doors with my own key, which is a big thing. <laughs> I can drive a car. I can go to Europe. I just went to Asia. I can undo a lot of things. But in your heart, you never feel free. You never feel whole again. And I know a lot of exonerees, and none of them will ever tell you they feel whole, because you don't. Uh, I know people that are parolees, that are guilty. They don't have that. There's something that touches your soul when you know that the government did this to you. They lied, they stole, they framed you, and they took your life away from you when there's no reason for it. This is something that's, you, don't, you never get over it. You just never do. It just, uh, it's kind of a violation of, of your life that you just can't, you can't really describe, but you never get away from it. I never, you know, I, I'm, <laughs> All my family died while I was in prison. My wife's family, they supported me all the way through, but they died. Um, so I'm actually living with one of the attorneys who got me out, one of the ones who proved evidence was planted. And I'm staying with her family because I'd be living in the streets otherwise. Uh, I was an engineer, I had a career, I was building a new custom home in the mountains, and I came out penniless. That's what happens to you. Uh, so, but even, Wendy, who is this new guy who was just exonerated, she worked on his case. She worked on four cases with the California Innocence Project, and they've all been exonerated now. So, but uh, even she doesn't understand when I tell her I still feel like I'm in prison. They don't get it. And Kim Long, who's another exoneree, like she says, she likes to hang out with exonerees because they get it. They understand. Nobody else can. You can't know what it's like to have that in your soul that it just it touches you it just leaves a hole that will never be filled but to go on to other issues with being an exoneree i'm still listed as a murderer we've been trying for two and a half years to get the doj to change my records they don't i'm still listed so if i get pulled over on the side of the road by a traffic cop he's going to have two things on here one it's going to show up i'm a convicted murderer the second thing is going to show up that the last entry was I was sent to prison for life. So in his mind, he's got to figure out, why am I here? Why is this murderer on the street? Is he an escapee or what? This is, this is a setup for disaster, especially in California. <laughs> you know, so it's going to turn into a felony stop, but at least four to six cops with guns drawn. That could be, as you know, a real disaster. But this is because the Department of Justice won't help us. Um, Tim Atkins has been out for 11 years. He's still fighting to get his records cleared. He was proven innocent, like I was. They won't let go. They won't give this stuff back to you. Um, 
compensation. California has a, a, a law that says they give you $140 a day. I'd have paid them $140 a day to stay out of prison easily. But that's all they offer you, but you can't get it. I haven't got it. Um, Tim hasn't got it. People are fighting for it. Very few people actually get this. Because instead of saying, OK, here's the law. You're innocent. We're going to let you go. We're going to make up for what we did to you. I lost a home, a career, my wife, all my family. This little bit of money wouldn't make up for anything. But they say, here it is, but you can't get it. You have to fight the state attorney general to get it. And a panel of DAs. I mean, talk about a biased group to try to get this money. <clears throat> so being an exoneree is not being a free man. You never feel free. It just doesn't happen. I won't go into all the details of what they did, how they planted evidence in my case, how they destroyed evidence that proved a real killer. Um, it, it's, it's extensive. It's, it's, it'd take more time than I could go here. So I just want to give you the feel what it's like to be an exoneree. And very much like Laura is addressing in her book. Yeah, it's just hard to describe. The rest of my life, I will probably never have that whole feeling. The reason I travel so much is I have advanced cancer because I didn't get treatment in prison. It took five years to find out after a test that I had it, but then it was too late to do too much with it. So this is what they left me with. I went, had a career, a family, a uh, future when I went to prison. I came out with advanced cancer. That's all I had. So, and I'm living on Social Security. So I'm not, not wealthy by, by any stretch. A lot of people think you walk out the door to hand you a big check. Good luck with that. Um, we are fighting. I do have a civil rights lawsuit against them. We are fighting. My lawyers would tell me mine's the most extensive case they've seen of documented perjury and planted evidence. So we do have a solid chance of getting this money. But due to my cancer, the money's all left in a living trust to different charities. So, as I said, I don't have any family anymore. So, um, this is what they do to you. They take you as just, uh, I'd never had any trouble with police. Uh, many exonerees don't. They just pick you, you're a convenient suspect. Um, I heard a lawyer once say that you can put a square peg in a round hole if you hit it with a big enough hammer. Well, that's what prosecutions in San Bernardino County are like. They just beat on it and beat on it and beat it. It took four trials to convict me, in four years, four trials. And every trial they rehearsed, they changed their testimony, they tried different lies. And finally, the last trial came up, was deadlocked. So we asked the judge, you gotta let me go. You can't keep doing this forever. She refused to accept it. She polled all 12 jurors. All 12 jurors said, no, we can't reach a verdict. She said, well, I'm gonna keep you here till you do, because I believe you can. 45 minutes later, they come back, I'm guilty after they'd been deadlocked for a week. They weren't going to sit there all summer putting up with this. So this is the justice system that we believe in. This is the justice system you see on TV where cops are always right, the judges are honest, they let guilty people go on technicalities. Um, well, I just hope that America wakes up because that's not at all. I just saw a thing on TV where they're talking about uh, Trump getting along with this guy in North Korea because of, why do you do that with civil rights violations? They need to look at their own house. They need to clean their own house. They need to look and see what police are doing in this county, in, the, in this country, not just the county. Um, that county's pretty bad, but there's others. Texas, I believe, had a phenomenal amount of wrongful convictions so, and executions. So um, these are things that people need to understand. And I don't know how better I can express it. So I'll let you go. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Christy Shepard. I'm from Oklahoma. Um, as Laura said, my cousin's murder was featured in John Gershon's book, The Innocent Man, which was actually about one of the men who was wrongfully convicted, Ron Williamson, who went to death row for, I believe, about 12 years. So when the murder happened, I was actually eight, and I 
my cousin Debbie had moved into her new apartment, and actually Ron lived in between us. We lived in the same on the same block. So I grew up um, when he was arrested, very fearful of him. I mean, um, he was the boogeyman. I knew exactly who he was. I knew what he looked like. Um, Dennis, the other gentleman who was arrested, didn't know a lot about him because it had always been portrayed to us that Ron was the ringleader. You know, he was the mastermind behind what had happened. Dennis um, got life and Ron went to death row. We were disappointed that Dennis didn't get death also. Um, you know, then years went by and we basically waited for the call. Um, we waited for the call to watch Ron be executed. That's that, In our minds, that was all that was left to do. Um, instead, uh, the Tenth Circuit, Judge C in the Tenth Circuit, overturned his conviction. And that was kind of the beginning of um, a whole different life for us. John Grisham, when they were exonerated, um, this was before you know Mr. Grisham's book, but we didn't know. We had seen some things in the paper about this DNA and testing not matching, and then they were going to test the genes, and then they were going to test the hairs, and it was just all kind of, But that was in 1997, I guess, 98. And so really the only thing at that time anybody had seen was O.J. Simpson. And that was completely foreign and a circus, and none of that made sense to really anyone. And so... Um, they were going to release them, and we found out by the paper. We found out with the rest of the town that they were going to be released and set free, and we all show up at the courthouse, and we get there, and there is every national news truck, satellites everywhere, every state news van, and I remember thinking, like, why do these people care? about these two clowns like what in the what in the world and um i get in the courthouse and you know that's packed and there's sheriffs everywhere and and i remember looking at his attorneys who i had seen a couple of them before but i couldn't put my finger on who the other one was and then it dawned on me that it was barry shack and i thought huh. he was one of oj simpson's lawyers like how this has got to be a joke. The, the, I don't know how these two clowns wound up with him, but this is just insane. Um, they actually had put in, uh, had had a gag order on the case, so they told us nothing about what was going on. Not that they told us much before, but we watched them walk out of the courtroom that day, plain dress clothes, hugging you know their family. Um, they rushed us back to another room where the victim coordinator came in and she's just wringing her hands. And uh, she said, well, I know today's been a really hard day, but <laughs> what we had also found out in open court was that this DNA, this mystery of DNA that didn't match Ron Williamson or Dennis Fritz, none of the hairs, I think they had 17 hairs and, and semen and none of it matched. It all matched one man when they ran it through the CODIS system, which was also the last man she was seen with. It was a high school friend that she knew from high school, and it was also a man who testified against Ron and Dennis. And like I said, they escorted us into another room to, I guess, make sure we were contained when they lowered the boom that he had escaped from prison that day, which it was actually the day before. but. Um, so he was on the run, and it's fascinating, too, to find out, I think, you know, with exonerees and how they find out about how they've been lied to and things have been hidden. It is very much the same way with victims' families. Years later, when we began to go to court for now the third and then on to the fourth time with the man who did match the DNA, we found out just the details of that prison escape was that it really wasn't an escape at all. Someone had brought him street clothes. He had a state vehicle and a pager that he was 
um, at a mall shopping with his girlfriend, who's supposed to be in minimum, minimum security prison. And um, he got a page that there were a reporters there to talk to him. And that's how he decided to make his exit instead of going back to his work site. Um, from there, it just kind of got worse because the more that we began to question about what really happened in her case and how, how all of a sudden the things didn't match up, the things that we had always believed, the things that we had held on to is the truth. Like the last minutes of her life, every, those were the truths. Um, none of that stuff matched anymore. It didn't make sense. And the more we tried to question, the more that was not well received. Um, I live in a very small town, less than 16,000 people. I go to the same church with a retired district attorney. It, you could cut the tension with a knife to this day. <laughs> it is, it is, it's not, it's not a, it's not a comfortable situation, um, because we built, we feel very lied to. Um, after Debbie was murdered, four other women were raped by the man that had really murdered her, while Ron and Dennis were innocent men in jail. Um, you know, and it. There was lots of circumstances as to why he uh, was never looked at, um, but it is so disheartening and um, I guess to have that realization that you think that justice, that they're there fighting for justice, that they're getting justice for your loved one and to find out that that doesn't exist, that that's not how, that's not how the system works. Um, which kind of threw me into, um, actually one day called um, Maddie DeLone, who is the executive director of the Innocence Project, and I said, I know you can't tell me this, so know that the question I'm about to ask you is crazy, but maybe you can help me figure out how to answer it. I want to know what you know about what happened to my cousin. That's what I want to know. And um, she put me in, you know, contact with some people. And then over the years, it's taken probably about 12 years, and I'm still trying to collect bits and pieces of information. Um, I was telling uh, Mr. Cole earlier, I had contacted the OSBI a year ago because I want to look at her file, and that takes director approval. And so they haven't, they haven't gotten back with me yet, but I'm sure they will. So, um, but yeah, it's very, um, and, and our family's not the only one. Um, I have met through the process of restorative justice um, other victims' families where if, if you go to the dark side, if you go against what, um, what your perceived role is, they will not help you. Um, I have a friend who her sister was murdered and because she stood behind the man who was exonerated, the district attorney purposely will not open her sister's case. And yeah, it's very, it's very frustrating. Um, right now in my county, there is a, you know, my cousin's been gone for 35 years and we have not had an ele elected district attorney in 30 years. They've all been appointed. Um, that's a whole nother story, but um, they, this comes up again, you know, it's, uh, it's so fresh with them, it's still such an open wound, um, and it, I mean, it's starting all over again. Yes? During the, the trial, <clears throat> and when the police and the DA were telling you what did they tell you was the reason they were certain Ron and Dennis were the, were the defense, were the, uh, the murderers? Um, and did you find out later though what you were told was for lies? Um, initially, you know, when I was younger, they told us that, well, we knew, we knew within a month because my cousin, um, her apartment, and it's kind of one of those things that you're able to market because her 
She was murdered on December the 8th and her apartment was released on December, on January the 8th. So my mother um, went and cleaned out the apartment. And when she got home that afternoon, she got a crank phone call that said, Debbie's dead and you'll die next. So she called the district attorney and said, I have to know what's going on. And that's when he told her, we believe it's someone in the neighborhood. Now, to their tell it, it was four months later that from an informant that they, you know, zeroed in on Ron Williamson, but it was 30 days later. Um, they, when I was in undergraduate school, before the exonerations took place, I interviewed um, the lead detective, and he told me that um, they believed that there was two because the writings on all the walls were plural. They believed that um, it was Ron. He had some kind of fixation on Ron from another case. Ron only had one friend. So Dennis was kind of guilty by association. And um, they just kind of fed us this line. You know, it, all the things that weren't really even evidence, but you know, anything that you get, you hold on to as the absolute, you know, God's honest truth. And, um, and then in order to, there was a handprint, and in order to um, put the final stuff, they um, exhumed my cousin's body, um, re retook the handprints that they had taken, five years before, said they got better handprints then, and, mm -hmm. yeah, and, um, and said that was all they needed, and that's what they went to trial for. And I think out of all of the, you know, the evidence and the things that I've tried to gather, the thing about the handprint is the thing that is probably the most, um, heart-wrenching for me because um, the day that my aunt signed the papers to have Debbie exhumed, they didn't ask anyone to come with her. They just told her to come down there. And they made kind of a big deal about it. They called her. They said, do you have a gun? Put the gun in the car where it's visible. Get here. Hurry. And so she's like, you know, tearing up the highway. She gets there and they're basically like, we need you to sign this paper. She said, I'm not gonna do that. You're not gonna bother her. And she, they said, do you want this case solved? If you want this case solved, you'll sign that paper. And then kind of was like, I don't even have to ask you. Her daddy already signed it, but I, you know, kind of like I'm doing you a favor. And so she signed it, but when she left, she went straight to my mother. She and my mother were very, very close and, and um, she went straight to my mother. She was disoriented. She probably should had no business driving. And she was like just rambling about how she was going to hold her again. And I'm going to get the chance nobody gets. And I'm going to get to see her. And I'm going to be there. And she was just out of her mind. And my mom admitted her to a mental health facility that day. So to me, of all that had happened, that is the day that they broke her. And it was also the day that my mother, it severed their relationship. She said, I can't do this with you anymore. I can't relive this. I can't do this anymore. So it was, that day is such a sad, sad point. But then to find out years later that that was a dog and pony show, that whole having her exhumed and the process of what happened and that um, to read the reports, they had told us the original reports, um, you know, just weren't good. But the original reports, I have it, it says that it excludes her as the person, but then they dug her up and then they, and it was the only time that that man had changed his a report in 22 years of having his job. But then during the civil suit, 
their expert says it's not her handprint. So, and that's what you, you know, like I said, there's no love loss, there's no, there's a district attorney's race going on right now, and it's not, it's not pretty, but. I did want to just take the remaining time that we have for questions that anybody has they can do for any of us. Um, I do for Bill, it's Bill, right? Mm -hmm. um, Bill, some of the, one of the things that I, I find, you had no prior record, right? So now you're in prison as a murderer. How did you, if you're at least tall, how did you survive? <laughs> I mean, did you have to do the race thing? You know, Everything in California prisons is by race. Whether you agree with it or not, you have no choice. Um, I always describe going to prison as like being dropped on a hostile alien planet, and I mean hostile. You have to learn a new culture, you have to learn a new language, you have to learn all these restrictions. Uh, you can walk around the, the, the track with a black guy one time, don't make it twice, you're going to get stabbed. Um, people try to get you into their little gangs and stuff, and yeah, I was six foot two and 200 pounds and in good shape, and I got a few scars, but I gave a few but eventually people leave you alone. But you're always challenged, you're always... You is there always any way to avoid it? I mean, can no. you, there's no way to just live your quiet little life? No, no. I, I got away with it a lot. Uh, people leave me alone. Uh, I'm a nice guy, I don't bother people. But you're always gonna run into somebody who's gonna challenge you because you're a nice guy, they think you're soft. And the fortunate thing is after you've been around a while, somebody always knows you and that's man, I gotta knock your head off, leave him alone. <laughs> you know. So but there's no way to just go in there and not get involved because like I say, everything is groups, gangs, um, even your neighborhood, you know, it, it breaks down all these different levels. It's like where are you from? I said Riverside, guys saying, You can't be, I don't know you. We didn't run in the same crowds, dude, <laughs> you know. But yeah, everything is yeah, in groups. Yeah. So. Then also, what about the statement of actual innocence? Being exonerated, did you qualify him for a statement Not of yet. innocence to get the re record sealed? I can actually, I had a conversation with um, someone from the compensation board um, within the last two months. <clears throat> and that is not a basis. A state, a, a judicial certificate of innocence does not automatically qualify you and in fact, they can reject your compensation claim, um, even though you have one. But and they've about, done it. What about Scott? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he came back in Scott one years ago. Well, that's so, okay. he, should, can't, he, he should be able to seal his record. Yes, yeah, the record. So with our client, as we all love with cash, um, we did get a certificate of innocence from the same judge. He issued one. And it is like Bill said, and that cash is. Um, just incredibly cautious, and he carries it with him everywhere. It's always with him. He always has it because of exactly what Bill described. He's terrified of getting pulled over and being arrested or, or shot or whatever. And so he has it as kind of like an insurance policy, but it, or an, a way of an official explanation. But it does not change the fact that there's this problem with it being on your record. And as Marie said, it doesn't necessarily guarantee you compensation from the state. So what many exonerees have had to do and what Bill and his really excellent legal team are doing now is you file a federal civil rights lawsuit and it takes it can take a really long time um, and when you have health problems and the state knows it they you know that's something that they have as leverage on, on their side so the it, you enter into a whole different kind of game I think once you're exonerated and trying to get some kind of monetary justice for yourself and also just sort of protect the integrity of your daily life yeah, Tim Atkins got a certificate of innocence probably seven, eight years ago. He's still fighting for his money. He's been out of love, never seen a penny. So he had no record, I believe, prior to that. He was 17 when they convicted him. And he's still fighting for any kind of justice at all. So just, uh, yeah. The yeah, system is broken. <laughs> What kept you going those years in the prison? I 
I'm just a stubborn bastard. I refuse to give in. <laughs> I refuse to quit. I refuse to let them say this about me. You know, they come at you all the time in time served deals when you're on trial and when we filed the writ of habeas every day. They walk in time served deal and go home today. No, you know. So I think it was just, there was one point that I stopped fighting. I wrote a book during that period of time. Uh, they had wrote, made this technicality and saying we, we're just not going to listen to all these legal people, I mean these uh, scientific people, we, we just don't have to listen to them. And at that point I figured, well, I, I did all I could. And at that point I sat down and I spent the next year and a half writing a book, you know. And it's in publishers right now, so I'm getting edited. It's not about my case. But uh, nonetheless, that's the only thing that kept me going, even through that period, was I had to keep my mind busy. But then when they passed a new law, then I went back to fighting again. But the fight is what kept me going. So. What about other people? I guess you are one of the smarter ones. I'd like to think so. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry to talk to you, but you know, I, I, I have been a long time public defender. And I found your story very compelling because we don't think about victims. But, and, and victims aren't asked a lot. I mean, even if you, um, I'm a, <laughs> to say that my cousin's case didn't affect me professionally, I'm, a licensed professional counselor on a degree in criminal justice and and so um, yeah it affects everything mm -hmm. you know this generational trauma that gets passed on to you know my kids who weren't even alive at the time but um, there's there's not a lot about victims there's not a lot of studies about victims um, Victims have a role to play, um, and when you don't play that role, um, there are consequences to that. In the last trial, I was grown by then, and I'd made up my mind that my aunt was going to, you know, this trial was going to be different, and they were going to talk to her, and they were going to inform her, and, and um, I had called the district attorney's office, and the assistant DA was going to be handling it. He agreed. He thought that was a good idea. But between that time when we talked and it was getting closer to going to trial, we had not gotten a phone call. I had had legislation filed through my local senator to start a justice commission to look into the wrongful conviction cases in Oklahoma. Evidently, that didn't go over well. <laughs> he was not pleased with me. So, you know, it was a couple weeks outside of court, and I called, and I said, um, I was just wondering it, when I called Peppy. I said, I was wondering when Peppy was going to get her meeting. And the secretary puts me on hold and comes back in a few minutes, and it's not the assistant D DA. She said, um, Christy, Chris says that if your aunt wants an appointment, she'll have to call and get one herself. And I said, really? Well, she hasn't called and gotten one in 30 years. And this will be the fourth trial. I don't see that she's probably going to call and get one. But tell him thanks for all his help. And then we went to the preliminary hearing, and she wasn't prepared. And they started dragging out evidence, and she didn't think that it was... She thought it was going to be kind of a short and sweet deal, and they started dragging out all the evidence, and she was very upset. So she went home, and I went over and had a down-in-the-floor fit in the lobby of the district attorney's office <laughs> and told them that this is, this is not going to ever happen this way again. And if you don't do this my way, if you don't talk to her, I will make sure that the victim of your mother never sits a day in that courtroom. And you can figure out how to answer it, but this is not going to go down like this anymore. I've, I've had it with you all. And none of us have ever spoken again. Although, there were two things, Christy, that I wanted you to mention if we have time. Um, one is that, as you might be able to tell, Christy is a force of nature, and she has had a big impact 
in Oklahoma, and people do pay attention to her. She was appointed, she was one of 14 people appointed to the Oklahoma Blue Ribbon, Blue Ribbon Commission to reassess the death penalty. After a series of really horribly botched executions, and maybe read about some of them, and it, there was a scandal about how drugs were being procured and administered, Christy was the only person on the panel who was not a lawyer or a politician. And she was really speaking for the victims. And she had an incredible impact on the panel. And so the one story I wanted you to tell was of the slide presentation that you gave to the panel when you were on the commission to educate them. And then the other story I wanted you to tell was the one about Peppy and Dennis at the in New York. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And um, during the um, the commission, I was the only um, commissioner who actually also presented to the commission. So, because I felt like even though these were very educated, um, you know, people who had spent lifetimes in learning about the law, I had lived how the law really plays out. I had watched the criminal justice system play out. I was eight years old and, and now, you know, I was in my forties. I had seen it all the way through and, and at its worst. Um, and so I presented to them and um, it really affected them, I think, that to see it from not just, you know, names on paper. Um, I did have one appeal judge who came and kind of patted me and said, well, you know, we try. And I was like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, but, um, is that the part you talking about? Well, I was talking about, I mean, so what she did was put together a really simple slide presentation that had pictures. and. There had been a question earlier, um, what evidence did they rely upon to convict Ron Williamson? And there were really two aspects to it, and one of them was that Ron was someone who had all these life prospects. He looked like he was headed for the major leagues and then baseball, and then he was just derailed by serious mental health problems. He was very mentally ill in a very obvious way, and so he was kind of the neighborhood boogeyman, which perhaps is why they focused on him. And Christy described, I think, to the commission how he behaved during the trial. So he, he yelled, he yes. pulled the table up. I mean, and he flipped, he flipped, flipped the table table. over. His lawyer was blind. I don't know if you remember reading that, but he, yeah, flipped the table over. He was screaming at Debbie's dad, I didn't kill your daughter, I didn't kill your daughter. They actually had to remove him a few days, you know, from the trial because he just, he couldn't be, um, you know, couldn't be settled down. Um, but I think to the jury, it played like someone who really could 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 be a killer. And then I think the last image that you left the the members of the commission with, and I should say that they published a very long report saying the moratorium needs to remain in place because there are so many problems with wrongful convictions. That was the reason that they gave all these people, some of them extremely conservative. But in any event, the last slide that they saw from Christie was a picture of Ron Williamson that was taken shortly before he died. And, you know, unlike Bill, he, he, he did get a settlement. But unlike Bill, also he was um, emotionally extremely fragile, and I'm not in any way diminishing what you went through, but he was, you know, very mentally ill. And then he also had cirrhosis of the liver, so there was a picture taken of him shortly before he died. I think he was only 53, and he's just emaciated, yeah. and he had pulled out his teeth. Um, and his hair was... What Harry had was literally like completely white. And where I had first seen that picture is Mr. Grisham had mailed me a copy of the book and signed it and thanked me. And, and of course, you know, when you get a book, you look at the pictures first. And so I was looking at the pictures and I, you know, like I said, I'd grown up with Ron Williamson and he is, he went to the minor league. He was a, he was a big man and he was loud and he was, you know, um, I'm a mental health counselor. I, you know, then I could see how he how he was, but um, I flipped to the back page and I just started crying. I was sitting in the kitchen. Of course, my husband, and my kids were like, "What's wrong with you?" <laughs> but I had not seen him how he was before he died, and 
So in, in that presentation, and now most presentations that I do, I tell people this is what death row does to people. This is what death row does to innocent people. He looks like a skeleton. He's like 53 years old. And that's the guilt that my family carries, which, you know, if you still to this day hear the district attorney talk or you hear, you know, other people say, well, we were doing our job. But the truth is, is that other than Ron's family, my family are the only ones that care about what happened to him. And we bear the guilt of, you know, from Debbie's sisters to Debbie's mother, mama, I mean, all of us, we feel horrible about what happened to him. And um, that's not uncommon. And, you know, in the restorative justice process that, you know, we've started, and um, that's certainly not uncommon for other victims' families that we're the ones that bear the weight of that. I know that we're coming to the end of our time, but I did just getting back to the restorative part because we've, we've been talking a lot about the anguish part and there is there is a story about Dennis Fritz who is still living, one of the other wrongfully convicted people and I was wondering if you would. And I, if I thought of, yeah. I would have pulled it up on the video but um, we had actually um, been invited out, they were going to give John Grisham an award at the Innocence Project um, at their fundraiser and um, at the end of the fundraiser, we were all kind of sitting at a table in the front, and I don't remember, I'll say kid because he was really young at the time, but now he plays on the Stephen Colbert, he's in the band. Wow. The guy who does the, he's like the leader of the band. On, anyway, I can never think of his name. But he's like this piano prodigy. Anyway, he was um, playing um, What a Wonderful World on the piano and Dennis was sitting a person over from my aunt Peppy and he said Peggy let's dance and she's she's very shy and she's she's like oh no 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 and he's like no come on and he gets up and he takes her by the hand and takes her onto the stage and they're dancing and it, there's a video to it but um, they're dancing to what a wonderful world and and so it was there was not a dry eye in the house and people were crying and then people were teasing Barry Shack of that was a stunt to get more money but, <laughs> but, he, but he was like he's like I could not that was not a stunt I could have never put that together I, you know but um, it was it's probably one of the best best moments and actually it was pretty neat that the the journalist that had written Ron Williamson's obituary that got John Grisham's attention, he was there. So the next article he wrote was about she and Dennis dancing, and so she made the New York Times after that. So it was pretty neat. And we still talk. Our families still talk. Um, I don't think Dennis is doing health-wise very well right now, the last I heard, but we, we keep up with one another. I was wondering, because in the United States we have an adversarial system, in Europe um, the judges take much more of an active role in the cases that they have. Um, I'm just wondering if your research has ever indicated whether an active or a passive judicial role has resulted in more um, bad convictions. That's a great question, and I don't know the answer. I've not looked at that. I mean, I can tell you that there are innocence projects now in China and in Ireland. I mean, certainly innocent people are convicted, not just in the United States. But well, I don't. Really, the Amanda Knox uh, trial. He, the judges were very involved, and it was um, almost almost a circus. That's true. Mm -hmm. I think that was because of the cameras. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've all met Amanda. She's a very nice young lady. But uh, you know what they did to her was just that, a circus. It's the best way to describe it. Um, I just want to thank everyone and also say, so as Simon will direct us all, but if anyone is in, and I don't, I feel weird saying this, but I'm happy to, I will be staging outside to sign any books that anybody wants signed by me. If, if that's something that you want to do, but I'm not. If I could just add it, because she won't say it. <laughs> If you're interested in the issue, and, and the quote from Justin, 
about um, it's every citizen's duty to um, learn uh, responsibility is the word I think he used to know uh, and about and acknowledge wrongful convictions because it's our collective system so if you're going to read anything this year this book covers from A to Z you've seen books about wrongful conviction cases you've seen books about different parts of the system this takes cases from the beginning to the end and past in, in a way that I've not seen and I think it's really a smart book so. Thank you. Buy the book. Um, I just I I can't resist adding my own uh, Ron Williamson anecdote. Um, there's a film called The Burden of Innocence made by a filmmaker named Ofer Baikel that was on Frontline on on PBS, and it's a follow-up to the film uh, The Case for Innocence. Uh, which was really one of the first documentaries that brought the issue of wrongful conviction and DNA exoneration to the, to the public. And The Burden of Innocence is a follow-up about what happened to the exonerees after innocence. And, the, and uh, so I showed it in my class on miscarriages of justice. And the last scene of that film is uh, with Ron Williamson. And he says, um, you know, to sum it up, I just would have rather never been born than to have had this life. And then he says, I'm sorry to say something so depressing and so negative, but, but you did come here and ask. And then he says, uh, it's not contagious. It's my life. And that's the, the end of the film. So. Um, after this, we have a reception uh, on the patio, and then uh, we're showing the film Crown Heights at around six o'clock in the McCormick screening room. Again, not here. That is at the 1070, the Humanities Gateway. And again, if you need directions, um, talk to me or someone else. Um, and we will have the director of Crown Heights, Matt Ruskin, there. Um, it's a feature film about a, a wrongful conviction based on a This American Life story. So if you have any questions about that schedule, please feel free to talk to me. And now I'd like to thank all of our panelists so much for coming and sharing their stories. And to thank all of you for coming.